Is Superman still relevant in an ever-changing world? Or is he just an anachronistic symbol of ethical standards we never really adhered to in the first place? Should a superhero act as judge, jury, and executioner? Or should they throw a living nuke in prison, knowing they very well could, and most likely will, break out, killing even more people? These are the ethical questions asked by our subject today, Superman vs. The Elite, a 2012 film that adapts the comic What's So Funny About Truth, Justice, and the American Way. I'm glad they kept the title short and spiffy. It's an animated film more about Superman's place in the world than any world-ending threat. However, is the film itself worthy of standing with the other elite Superman adaptations? Or will it be carried by its themes and moral messages? Well, let's not waste any time in dissecting Superman vs. the Elite. The movie begins with a 1960s punk-inspired intro that's a reference to the inspiration of our antagonist, an antagonist that we'll delve into later in this video. But for now, we focus on the most iconic staple of any Superman story, Lois and Clark discussing Superman's merchandising and brand cohesion. No, but in all seriousness, one thing this movie gets right, right away, is Clark and Lois's banter. Lois is exactly how she should be portrayed. Quick-witted, sarcastic, and a go-getter, all while showcasing a softer and more caring side, as she is one of the few people that Clark can confide in over the course of the film. But Soups gets cock-blocked by the Atomic Skull, and after a quick scuffle and millions in property damage, Papa Zack would be so proud. Superman attends a UN meeting, discussing one of the major ethical dilemmas of this film. Superman refusing to kill his opponents and establishing the conflict between Belalia and Pokolostan. In fact, Belalia is currently under siege, right now. And Pokolostan has just unveiled a secret weapon. Giant. Spider. Robot. Things. Is the head of Pokolostan's bioweapons division a nine-year-old boy? Superman destroys the robots, with the assistance of his new friends, the Elite. The Elite are a new superhero team composed of its leader, Manchester Black, a telepath with a terrible, incurable disease, being British, Coldcast, a black man with electric powers, never seen that before, Menagerie, a reptile snake lady who is eternally horny, and Hat, a magician that can pull anything out of his hat, but mostly pulls out booze. Despite helping him out, Superman is skeptical about the morality of people who call themselves the Elite. So, Soups and Lois go to England to learn more about Manchester. This is a major plot hole in this film, because there is no lead that could possibly imply that Manchester Black is from the UK. While there, Superman meets up with the Elite. There, he learns Manchester Black's backstory. Because screw these guys, I guess. Black is the only Elite that gets expanded upon in any capacity, and he's the mouthpiece for the group's moral positions. The other members get very little characterization outside of one-note gimmicks. And the comic actually gives less characterization, if you can believe that, because it's only 40 pages long. Anyway, back to Black. We find out he isn't an orphan like most superheroes, but he wishes he was one, because he has a stereotypical, abusive, alcoholic father. He and his kid sister would run scams, pit-pocketing people to get by. After getting caught by the coppers, they proceed to enact basic procedure and throw the little girl onto the tracks of an oncoming train, just like how the Academy taught him. But before she can get turned into a Jackson Pollock painting, Black's powers unlock, and he is swiftly taken away to British intelligence to be used as a weapon. Black's history and design perfectly illustrate why Black feels the way that he does. His experiences from his father to his government showed him firsthand how authority figures can abuse their power. His outlook is also reflected on his design. He looks like a 1960s British punk, a group that was staunchly anti-authority and championed the do-it-yourself ethic, an ethic that will be made very clear later in this movie. Over the course of Superman working with the Elite, he discovers their less-than-humane practices. However, he is even more shocked and appalled to see that the average Joe is not disgusted by the Elite's actions, but instead, the common man cheers on the Elite. This leads to the heart of the film, as Superman has to grapple with the concept that maybe his brand of justice is old hat. The world is changing, getting bigger, 
and it might not have room for Superman anymore. In response to his self-doubt, Pa Kent gives Clark a great speech about in this ever-changing world, a symbol of hope is needed now more than ever. However, that better way is going to have to wait, because the people will receive the bloodshed they desire, as Atomic Skull breaks out of prison and is subsequently killed by the Elite, skyrocketing their already soaring popularity. This solidified support emboldens the Elite to take the war between Belalia and Pokalistan into their own hands, as they just murder most of the higher-ups from both countries, ending the war and supposedly bringing peace. You know, instead of the obvious power vacuums that murdering two authoritarian countries' leaders and their entire cabinets would create. In response to this, Superman attacks the Elite, officially making them his enemies. However, the Elites don't want to throw down just yet, as they want the entire world to see the toppling of the Old Guard and its ideals. On the day of the fight, both parties agree to go somewhere where no one can get hurt, and their immediate choice is... the moon. Oh, oh yeah, 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 that'd be my first pick too. If you're asking how the Elite can survive on the moon, their ship, which is a dimension-hopping creature, don't ask, supplied the moon with oxygen. You know, in the comic, they fight on an alien planet somewhere, which makes a little bit more sense, as it already supports life, so it's easy to assume that it supports human life as well. The finale of this film is easily its shining moment. Not only is the final action sequence well choreographed, showcasing each of the Elite's unique powers, but showcases one of the best Superman moments in the character's history. After getting jumped, Superman seemingly snaps and easily defeats the Elite suddenly killing all but Manchester Black, who he swiftly lobotomizes. Superman looks completely unhinged in this scene, showing how scary he could be if he really tried. And that fear Superman creates works perfectly in his favor, as his killings were faked. However, they were made to appear real to show the world how the actions they were celebrating looked from the perspective of those sentenced to death. Superman took the advice of Pa Kent, and found another way, in a way that only Superman could. Rather than seeing those with deep ideological disagreements as his enemies, Superman sees them as people first and foremost. People that needed an up-close and personal example of what they claimed they wanted, to shock their system, to see the errors of their ways. This leads us to the ethical questions of this movie. Should Superman, and other heroes like him, kill their villains? Well, it'd be very easy. Superman could kill Lex Luthor, for example, a thousand times before he would even know it was coming. However, the reason Lex gets away with his crimes is because he's a mastermind, expertly covering his tracks and thriving in plausible deniability. So if Supes did kill him, he would be killing a man he merely believes is a kingpin. Whether he is right or not, Lex would not be able to defend himself in a court of his peers. And I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to live in a world where being suspected of a crime acts as evidence of wrongdoing in of itself. There is a reason that we have the rules and red tape that we do, and just because sometimes it feels easier to break those rules for short-term games, the long-term effects of the degradation of our institutions and rules would be far worse than any glee one might receive seeing the wrong people fall no matter the cost. Speaking of cost, what would be the cost if the world lost Superman? Is Superman even needed in our world today, now, and forever? Superman isn't just a caped crusader, but a symbol of hope. His strength, cunning, compassion, and never-ending optimism enshrines Superman as a cultural staple that can stand the test of time. If you haven't seen Superman vs. the Elite, I'd recommend it. The film understands the character better than most adaptations, and the characterization is mostly on point, with the voice cast doing a very great job overall, with some standouts being George Newborn of Justice League fame reprising his role of Superman, and Robin Atkin Downs putting his all into Manchester Black. It boasts a visually interesting art style that's able to capture the comic's more visceral scenes while remaining visually unique to the comic. I do wish that the other members of the Elite were more than just cardboard cutouts, and even though it's a comic book movie, 
It's asking you to believe some wacky shit with barely any explanation. But overall, Superman vs. the Elite is a perfect showcase to why Superman matters.